Welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm an engineer at IT Pro TV. With me today is Cameron Guerra, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me today, Cam. Of course, Taylor. Glad to be here. Uh, we got an exciting uh, topic to talk about today and something that's impacted us here at IT Pro TV. Uh, and so, you know, I'm really excited because we have a special guest with us today. Our Haskell wizard himself, Cody Goodman, is here. Um, and Cody's going to help us kind of talk about um, async control flow because we discovered some issues with some of our code base because of, of an issue with an underlying, you know, the async control flow in Haskell. So, um, welcome, Cody. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, uh, like you're saying, um, we had an issue with Postgres Simple. I guess I'm jumping right into it as. The <laughs> hey, that's okay. Yeah, let's get right into it. <laughs> um, so we we got to work. We saw a nice little Sentry error in our Teams channel that said libpq query in progress, and we're like, "What? Huh? <laughs> What's going on there?" Um, Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so we we go and we dig a little deeper and. Eventually, we find out that um, a long-running batch process was sometimes dying, and it was leaking a connection back into the pool, which then if another connection tried to use that pool, say a, a web process or something, it would get a libpq failed, another command is in process progress error uh which is kind of shocking <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah we would only get this sometimes right because like the bad connection would get put back in the pool but it would be in the process of cleaning up so if enough time passed the connection would be good again so you wouldn't see this error yeah right. exactly yeah, and, uh, you know, and we had a lot of various libraries to look at here. You know, we had LibreQ, Postgres Simple, Resource Pool, Resource T, Persistent, Persistent PostgreSQL. So there's a lot at, at play here. And Cody, I, I know you've spent a lot of time on this. So I'm really excited that you, know, you can you know be here and, and talk to us because I know you worked with Matt Parsons um, after fa after filing an issue in um, Persistent that then led to our discovery of what was really going on underneath so uh, you know talk through you know the minimal case to reproduce the bug if you don't mind yeah uh, so the first thing is uh, you know how do we get that high level description of we have some process that's inserting some things and it's causing the connection pool to become bad how do we get that into code uh, and then, you know, you have something, try to pull that back out of the pool and reuse it. Uh, one of the first things, which uh, I actually overlooked at first, is just having a pool with only one resource. Um, because otherwise, it's sort of like gambling. Uh, <laughs> not a good use of your time. Um, you don't want to play slots at work? <laughs> <laughs> pull it. Oh, triple sevens, I win. Might have been closer to like Russian roulette with the connection pool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like... yeah. All money on red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, we had, like Cody mentioned, this was like a background process that was doing this. And as is so common when you want to open a bug against one of the open source libraries that you're using, it's not very helpful for the maintainer to say, you know, this happens in our closed source application and uh, we think it's your fault, so please fix your library. We, we wanted to have something public we could point to and say, look, this is the problem we're running into. So we were trying to take, you know, our tens of thousands of lines of code that are under consideration for our app and point it to one of those libraries that Cam mentioned earlier, one of the seven different libraries that could be at fault here. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Cody, you were talking though about, yeah, you, pro you started with more than one uh, you know, a pool with more than one resource, and then you kind of narrowed it down, right, to test with that one, like a one resource pool. 
Right, because, you know, that that single mistake there, not just taking a second to say, okay, uh, let's let's make sure we get this right, that, that cost me some time because mm -hmm. sometimes it wouldn't fail. I was like, why, why is this not reproducible? I can't just put this example that only sometimes fails up there. I, I guess mm -hmm. I could. Matt's a nice guy. He probably ran it more than <laughs> once. <laughs> yeah. But you, you want it to be easy for the maintainer to reproduce this problem so that you know, maybe you'll nerd snipe them and they'll be like, huh, that's weird. That shouldn't happen. And ideally that'll happen the first time, the first time they try it. Yes. Yeah, which yes. seems to be eventually what happened. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, you partnering and working with Matt a lot on this, you know, helped. And, you know, obviously Matt's got the, a post about it. I know you have a lot of notes and stuff from it. So, you know, I think there was a great experience for, you know, anybody who's working with a library that, you know, starting to create some issue, like it's a good example to say, Hey, like it's okay to create an issue. And, and if you can make that reproducible bug, you can work with the maintainer to create a solution and help everybody that uses the library, not just your own team. Right. And it's funny you bring up nerd sniping Taylor, cause really I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this nerd snipes some people and we can actually answer this question and improve Haskell as a whole. Uh, so I'll, I'll say, I'll say something provocative here. I don't think many people actually know the root cause here. There's still a lot of unanswered questions and I don't think a lot of people know about any secret exceptions in Haskell. I hope to be proven wrong and we can figure <laughs> this out and, and add some documentation and improve everything as a whole. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think you you made a good point is like, what is like asynchronous exceptions and what are, you know, what's the difference between synchronous control flow and asynchronous control flow. Um, could you give us a kind of high level overview of that, Cody or Taylor? Cody, I think you're the one to answer that, putting you <laughs> on the spot here. Uh, yeah, I've kind of been drowning in for two weeks, so hopefully I understand uh, <laughs> what they are well enough to describe it. Um, so synchronous exceptions are basically just on the same thread. Uh, there's something like uh, if you use the unsafe head function, um, this list was empty. Uh, an asynchronous exception is easier to think about in terms of like your computer telling you, telling your process that it ran out of memory and then canceling your thread. Uh, where your computer here is more specifically the GHC runtime. Okay, so I, I normally conceptualize an async exception as coming from a different thread, but it sounds like if you think of the GHC runtime as a separate thread, then that kind of fits into that understanding as well. Right. And analogies are lossy, but hopefully that's a good one to sort of start with and uh, be aware there's more subtleties. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and is there any difference here? You mentioned using unsafe head, which throws either undefined or error or something like that. Is there really any difference between that and control.exception.throw? Or for these purposes, are those basically the same? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little spotty on that. You might have to help me out, but uh, I think it's precise versus imprecise exceptions. Something like that. Okay. And, and maybe the, the thing we should be comparing against is throw IO or like the, the monad throw constraint, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think for our purposes, as far as this bug is concerned, it didn't really matter if it was a precise or imprecise exception. It mattered if it was synchronous or asynchronous. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Cam, are you satisfied with that uh, description of asynchronous control flow? Yeah, I appreciate it as the, the least Haskellish wizard here to get that understanding <laughs> and I appreciate your analogy of and, and wording of, you know, how that relates to GHE runtime versus, you know, not. So thank you, Cody, for that explanation, Taylor as well. Um, you know. And maybe one other thing we should mention actually before we move on from async control flow is how you manage them, right? So with normal synchronous exceptions, you can add a catch or a handle around it. And if, if you evaluate everything at the right time, then you can deal with that exception. And with async exceptions, normally you don't catch them that way. Is that right, Cody? Right. Uh, you normally don't, and that's, that's actually a really big piece of this is the whole problem of bracket and resource finalization. Uh, you you mm -hmm. really struck a chord here, if you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, 
there was a big thread on this a, a while back. Uh, Bracket does not use uh, what is it called? Uninterruptible blocking. Uh, uninterruptible masking. masking. There we go. Right. Masking. Yeah, which wasn't named blocking because of reasons. I, I don't remember the reason. <laughs> uh, but yes, masking, interruptible masking versus uninterruptible masking. Uh, that basically means can the runtime system block uh, what you're doing inside of this code or can it not? And there Okay. And, and let's, let's unwind that a little bit. So starting with the basics, bracket is a function where you tell you set up how to acquire a resource and how to release a resource and then you use the resource within that so the most common example i think is with file like open a file is acquire close a file is release and then once you have that file handle you can write to it read from it do whatever you want and masking uh like you mentioned has to do with the runtime can it interrupt what's going on there or not um maybe interrupt is the wrong word to use but uh I, I typically conceptualize masking as uh, can an exception be thrown into, like while this code is running, can it receive an exception or is it, should it avoid, should the runtime avoid sending exceptions while this code is running? Mm -hmm. Should it wait until it finishes? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, and for here specifically, what we're concerned with is uh, the release portion of that bracket. That is when that that file handle that you took, you acquired from the file system, when you're releasing it back to the file system so all the other things can make use of it, uh, can the GHC runtime cancel that process? Are you just going to have uh, these file handles out there that can't be reused? Right. And, and the problem could be that you start releasing the file handle and then GHC interrupts that release process with an async exception, for instance, saying you're out of memory, something like that. And then th because of that, you don't finish releasing that handle, but whatever code around that called a bracket thinks that the release has been run successfully. So you have this kind of like, uh, I don't know, Schrodinger's file handle of it's not open, it's not closed, it's in this weird state that it wasn't meant to be in. Mm-hmm. Okay, so hopefully that kind of explains what we're dealing with here with bracket and masking, right? Cam, you mm -hmm. feeling good with that explanation? Uh, I'm feeling okay. Uh, our communication <laughs> channel here broke up in the middle of your last statement, so I lost a little bit of what you said. But overall, I think it's helpful. Um, and, you know, obviously I think, you know, async exceptions aren't talked about enough, kind of like Cody mentioned earlier, which, you know, makes it seem like you're you're all alone in the situation it's like wait a second there are other people who face it they just don't talk about it either because they don't they're like the community just doesn't think about and talk about async exceptions in a regular format like they just it, it's a kind of the um kind of the black sheep of haskell maybe like this yeah. thing that everybody knows is wrong but they just there's no hasn't been the bandwidth of time to take care of it and find the, the perfect solution. But I think mm -hmm. now with the community growing, creating a foundation, you know, with that will start to provide more resources and maybe more uh, platforms for discussion and debate about you know, what async control flow should look like and how we should handle async exceptions, will move the language forward. And so I'm really looking yeah. forward to seeing how that how that comes, you know, and maybe make it more approachable to other people because if you you know aren't super invested and then you all of a sudden come across this kind of issue and you're like oh no i'm back away i'm not gonna go any closer to that because it's not worth it for me because i'm not sure what the heck's going on here or nobody seems to be talking about it so there's not really support for this and i'm out right yeah it could be demoralizing like you mentioned if you're new or newer to the language and you run into this problem and Nobody seems to be talking about it. So you're like, well, this is just some insane edge case that I happen to run into. Well, may maybe not. Maybe it's pretty common, but nobody talks about it or everyone just hopes that it doesn't happen to them. And we got unlucky and it happened to us. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, 
you talk about Haskell adoption. Uh, if somebody at a big company starts trying to use Haskell, they convince their team to use Haskell, and uh, then they get a Postgres error like this, you know, an issue with what's supposed to be a core library, uh, a, a binding to Postgres that everyone relies on, you know, a data.pool, something everyone thinks of is bulletproof. Um, that's pretty scary. You know, that's going to make you really rethink things. That's not going to make that person who, who put their neck out to uh, get their team to adopt Haskell look very good. Right. Doubly so, since Haskell has a reputation of being focused on correctness. And if you can immediately run into a show-stopping bug with, like you mentioned, one of the most popular, you know, libraries, then that's not, not a good look. Um, it is worth mentioning that there are library level solutions to this problem. I think the Unlift IO library um, does resource finalization differently with the bracket function that it exposes. So if the persistent library or the whole you know menagerie of packages we rely on here happened to use Unlift IO, we wouldn't have run into this problem. Um, or if Unlift IO was just part of the base library, mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, that, that was my understanding as well. Uh, I have a little bit of doubt, though, and the reason for that is I, I replaced pretty much everything in the Postgres pers part of Persistent with Unlift.io, including uh, forking data.pool and, uh, mm -hmm. or not, yeah, yeah, using someone else's PR that replaced all of it with Unlift.io, and it still didn't solve the problem. I had a lot of things running. I could have got something wrong in there, but... It, it at least deserves to shake that confidence a little, I think. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I mentioned Unlift.io is that I'm reasonably sure its bracket release uses an uninterruptible mask, Correct. which means that the runtime wouldn't be able to interrupt this release. Um, but some people don't like that as a default choice because then if your release sits there and like has an HTTP timeout and takes 30 seconds to do something, your program is completely unresponsive for 30 seconds because like hitting control C is an async exception thrown from the runtime to your program, so you wouldn't be able to respond to that until that release wraps up. Uh, I think the answer there, um, it seems kind of simple, maybe someone else has recommended it, someone else probably has, is to make bracket use an un un uninterruptible mask by default and to take a required timeout. Yeah, uh, that would make me happy. Same. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so we've been talking about masking and bracketing uh, and interrupting and all this stuff, but let's, um, let's come up a little bit and let's talk about how we ran into this problem in the first place. Because like we mentioned, not many people talk about this. And I think it's because most of the time in usual circumstances, people aren't going to run into this. And we were doing something a little unusual. Cody, could you explain what we were doing? Yeah, if I recall, we had an outer left join and we didn't have a distinct in combination with that. So we were doing like, a, maybe it was Cartesian uh, of a thousand or 10,000 rows and it turned into like 50,000 or 100,000 queries, one of the two. Uh, results, not queries, but yeah. Results, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had... Uh, a join and then an aggregation and we were duplicating the uh, that field over and over again and then we were iterating over that aggregation so we we tried to batch something up into like 10,000 rows but each of those rows contained several thousand aggregated together fields within it uh, so the data set we were looping over was really large so that, that was a big select right and then we we're also doing an insert at the same time right yeah, we were uh, we hadn't moved to streaming with persistent yet, and we were doing uh, a solution where we did the selects and then inserts right after. So it added up to a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah, so we kind of like accidentally got into this situation, and you know there was a bug in our query, and we have since fixed it. But that doesn't mean we wouldn't have run into this problem otherwise. Just that it would have been much less likely. Right, we would have had to have more processes going that were requiring that thing I, I think here you know this could happen to anyone like that's really what we're trying to say here is that you know you're not alone if this happened to you or if you've struggled with this or anything like that like we we're all in this together as a community yeah. and we're trying to like you know really 
you know, get get everything figured out, you know, create mm -hmm. you know, the best version of Haskell we can create and all have happy, fantastic uh, job satisfaction because we're fantastic <laughs> Haskellers. It sounds like we may need a support hotline for, <laughs> are you or someone you know affected by async exception <laughs> handling in Haskell? <laughs> Call this number now. <laughs> async helpline. Yeah. Can we get uh, yeah. Michael Snoyman to say some words of I support? I think it would just be, it would be his personal phone number. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Sorry, uh, Snoyman, but there you go. Yep. You're on the hook now. Um, but yeah, so so we ran into this problem. In a way, we were kind of fortunate to have this bug because Cam, like you mentioned, maybe we, we would have run into this only as our data set got larger. And then it would have been like, well, this thing was working fine for months and months and then it just exploded. What happened? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of lucky. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also in a way a little encouraging to see that other libraries that we use are also susceptible to this problem. And, and on the flip side of that coin, it's a little discouraging because like, well, you know, this seems like it's kind of pervasive. Um, but yeah, the, the Q library that we use, ha it keeps track of how many times it tries a job so that it doesn't try something over and over again. And that bit of logic wasn't working because the, like, uh, I, I assume is implemented with bracket behind the scenes. I don't remember. Do you, do you know, Cody? I'm fairly sure it was bracket, but I, I wouldn't bet money on it. But yeah, so it would, you know, check the count. And then if the count was too high, it, it would put it into this failed state rather than waiting to retry. And we, we have a limit of 10 retries on our jobs and these jobs that were failing in this particular way with this async exception, were getting retried hundreds of times instead. And so that was like, huh, that's weird. So we haven't chased that bug down yet, but I bet it's going to be a, the same or a similar root cause. Yeah. And when, when I saw that, I was, I thought, you know, am I going crazy to did something else change? You know, what other millions of things could I have done wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Cody, I think, uh, you had a good kind of thought experiment here for, um, you, we, we were lucky in a way to run into this bug, but is there a way this could have been pre prevented in the first place? Right. Right. Um, and I was thinking about that. The only real way I think this could have been prevented is if uh, when writing PostgreSQL simple, you you write functional tests that presume whatever pattern it, it should be used in a, uh, I guess, a professional space, which would be with uh, the pool library. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a big overhead to ask of somebody who's already creating your PostgreSQL bindings. Uh, right. so it's kind of a hard problem, but that, that's what would have mm -hmm. been necessary to prevent this. Right. And we should say that while that test did not exist, it does now exist. So as part of Matt chasing down the root cause here and fixing it in persistent, he wrote a test case. So we're pretty confident there won't be a regression there. Um, but you know, it would have been nice to have it at the outset. Right. Uh, and there's a related PR in PostgreSQL simple that it hasn't been merged yet or uh, reviewed, I don't think. Uh, but hopefully there can also be a test to put in there since pretty much all the other database libraries, you know, Opali, uh, Zelda, uh, and I think maybe Beam, they depend on PostgreSQL simple too. Right. Yeah, it was interesting because we reported, or Cody, you reported this bug and then there was this kind of synchronicity going on where two other people reported the bug almost at the same time in different libraries. It's like, what's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> Weird to see. Yeah. And, uh, I tried to weave a, a tangled web that you can follow and, uh, see all the related <laughs> things there. Um, I also include a link to some notes where I'm trying to figure out the real reason, the real root cause of everything here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll add those links into the show notes. And like you mentioned a while ago, Cody, um, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, man, those guys are dummies. The solution is so <laughs> easy. It's this thing. Uh, please tell us, we would love for somebody to just waltz in and tell us what the, what the answer is. That'd be great. Yeah. And I think it'd be <laughs> insightful for everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll release a follow-up episode if that happens with, uh, <laughs> with yes. you as a guest. We were dummies. Here's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you would be a first-class guest here. We'll pay for your flight and everything. Come in studio. <laughs> Fancy stuff. You know, all, all paid expense trip. 
I'm not, Cam's writing some checks. I don't know if we'll be able to cash them or not. <laughs> I'm just joking, but we would love to know if there is a better solution or the right yeah. solution. Um, but um, well, one one solution is using a different library, right? So, Cody, you mentioned that most of the ecosystem ultimately relies on PostgreSQL simple. Mm -hmm. That kind of underpins everything, but there is an alternative, right? Right. Um, there is a library that no one seems to know how to pronounce in my circle called Haskell or HaSQL. I'm really not sure. H-A-S-Q-L, if you want yeah, to be really there, verbose. There we go. H-A-S-Q-L. Um, <laughs> I thought I was just laughing SQL, like, ha, SQL. Ha, SQL, <laughs> take that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it's supposed to be. Um, so I, I was led back to HaSQL. I'll go with that. Um, <laughs> because when I was searching for this issue, they had libpq command in progress in their test suite. So they had a regression mm. test for mm. it, and I was like, that immediately made me think, hey, they've, they've been here before. What would it take to to replace PostgreSQL simple with a SQL. And um, yeah, that was, that was a thought. Uh, part of me wishes I would have just tried to replace the PostgreSQL persistent stuff with a SQL. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that could have been. Yeah, cool. that could be an interesting thing to chase down, make a persistent a SQL binding library. And, you know, the whole point of persistent is that hopefully we'd be able to switch that out behind the scenes without having to change our code. Um, but we did not do that. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, what's what's even funnier is I had that thought and then Matt Parsons, while I was talking to him, he actually said, you know, unprompted, maybe it would have been faster to rewrite this with a SQL. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah. If you're listening to this podcast and that sounds like a fun project to you, please take it on. <laughs> we would adopt. We're um, early adopters. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that HaSQL is a, um, it's by Nikita Volkov and it's very focused on correctness and it uses, I think, the binary protocol to talk to Postgres and it tries to represent as much as possible on the value level. So instead of like throwing an exception if something goes wrong, it'll pull back in either, and then you have to deal with that however you want. So that's one of the reasons I think that it does have this case is because Nikita was really going through this with a fine tooth comb, trying to find stuff like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna have to actually look how he handles things like uh asynchronous exception you know like stack out of memory error or whatever uh because one of mm -hmm. the common criticisms of handling exceptions like that at the value level is well what are you just going to case on some exception <laughs> <laughs> yeah why not <laughs> i mean we kind of have some plots in our code base but yeah you know. uh well awesome you guys have anything else you want to chat about in regards to async control flow and async exceptions that's it for me well, I think that's everything. I'll be writing books on books in my notes. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, we look forward to seeing that stuff. Uh, thanks, Cody, for being on the show. And thank you all for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I've been your host, Cameron Guerra. And with me today was Cody Goodman and Taylor Fossack. Uh, find out more about Haskell Weekly. Check out our website, haskellweekly.news. And if you enjoyed the show, please, please, please rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts. Just helps more people find us. It'd be awesome. And if you have any feedback, always feel free to tweet us at Haskell Weekly on Twitter. Uh, we are brought to you by our employer, IT Pro TV, which is an ACI learning company. They would like to offer you 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. You can redeem that by checking out, going through the normal flow, and adding the promo code Haskell Weekly 30 at checkout. Um, so please go to itpro.tv and sign up for a subscription. But that'll about do it for us today. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Peace. <laughs>